Um, hi everyone. Uh, it's like, let's say it's a workshop because it's only 45 minutes, so normally I try to let you do stuff hands-on, but I think 45 minutes is a bit short. Um, so I will mainly demo stuff. You can try out some stuff as well uh, if you want to, and you actually get to do the requests for me. So um, we have a live application, and you will be driving the application basically. But we'll get to that in a moment, so let's try to dive in. I have a few intro slides, and then we'll ditch the slides and just do stuff live. And I'm still not sure when to speak to this side and when to speak to this side, but I'll try to switch around. Um, so I kind of had the idea for this talk when I saw that very nice tweet uh, that every uh, in microservices that every outage is like a murder mystery because he has little traces here and there, and you start searching for things everywhere. And if you like murder mysteries, this is maybe the perfect thing for you um, because you get all the little traces and then you try to put together the little traces. And um, if your boss is standing behind you and shouting down your neck, uh, probably it's not that much fun. So um, oftentimes this is us uh, and we're saying kind of, this is fine. <laughs> and no, you don't need to raise your hand who thinks that this is you or this is your replication. Uh, it's just like sometimes you also reach this, uh, what the hell is my problem? Uh, and we don't want to get there. This is basically the idea to figure out that stuff is burning before we are actually on fire. Uh, that is kind of like where we want to get. Um, so it's kind of the idea is to log, ping, monitor, trace all the things in our system. That's the general idea. Um, why am I talking about that? Well, I, I'm working for Elastic. Uh, we have all these nice tools. We started off with full text search and then we started to do other things as well because we still do search. We just think that, for example, logs are oftentimes a search problem as well because nobody wants to store logs. Everybody wants to find relevant information in logs. So it's more or less searching your logs what is interesting and it's not just storing them. So we have all these tools and we want to dive a bit more into that. Um, so I generally build very highly monitored Hello World applications and today is no exception. Uh, it's not a real application. Uh, we will simplify some stuff. We'll try not to cheat too much. So we'll use proper certificates and we'll use multiple instances. Uh, but it's probably a bit more simple than your real application. Uh, but you should probably get the idea and take away uh, a lot of things that we do here. Uh, if you want to see the code, um, I have that at the very end as well. So you can just watch now and take a picture of it at the end if you liked it. Uh, but this is generally where all the code for today is. And I can post the slides afterwards as well, but most of the meat is basically just in the code. And it's a very simple Java application, though we don't really care for Java today. Uh, it's mostly about configuring stuff and putting stuff together. So what are we doing? We take a very simple application. Um, it doesn't have load balancing, it doesn't have auto discovery, it doesn't have any of the so-called microservice patterns. Um, let's say we're using microservices, but I'm using kind of a different definition of microservices. So uh, as long as the names are very short, it's also kind of micro. Um, that's, the, that's the definition that we'll stick to today. Um, I, I don't want to get too much into uh, what is micro and what is not micro and all the patterns there. We will focus on the monitoring side, okay? So. Everything has to run in the cloud today, uh, and my application is no exception, so we always have to pray that the internet gods are with us today. Uh, otherwise, we'll have terrible things. Uh, generally, I'm using the cheap AWS instances, the light sale ones. I have uh, set up the instances with Terraform and provisioned my application and deployed with Ansible. Uh, that's all in the repository, though I don't want to spend too much time on that. If you have more questions, we can discuss afterwards. Um, we have our own cloud service to run, Elasticsearch and Kibana, and I'm just using that. Uh, and generally, everything that I'm showing you today is open source. You can just take it, use it for free, build your own stuff, extend it, send us pull requests, uh, figure out what is working, what is not working, so you're free to do whatever you want. So that is generally our stack, if you have seen it or have not seen it. Um, today, we'll focus on just three of these components. So we'll use beats, which are like lightweight agents, which will collect your information. These are like forwarders, shippers, agents, whatever you want to call them. Uh, the beats are written in Go, so you have native binaries, no dependencies on any runtime environment. They're very lightweight and just ship your data off as efficiently as possible. And that data can be log files, it can be metrics like system and application metrics, it can be network data, it can be pinging services, uh, it can be security events, but you will see those. Elasticsearch is kind of the center where we store all the data 
And then Kibana is there to visualize. We also have Logstash. And Logstash is more like an ETL tool. So it can load data from lots of sources, transform it, change it, and then store it to either Elasticsearch or other source uh, destinations like Amazon S3. We don't need that today. We'll just use the beats to collect the information. But there are scenarios you where you need uh, Logstash. For example, if you want to pull data out of a relational database, Logstash has a JDBC connector. And you can just pull out the data from there uh, and use it elsewhere then. So this is the general setup. So what we have is uh, we have a front-end instance, a back-end instance, and a monitoring instance. And all of them will uh, just uh, forward their data to Elastic Cloud. So we have Elasticsearch and Kibana running there. So on our front-end instance, we have a Spring Boot application behind an Nginx reverse proxy. And then we have four beats running to collect different things, but we'll dive into the different beats a bit later. Then we have a backend instance which has the same thing running where we collect similar information. And then we have a monitoring instance uh, which is mainly there to monitor stuff and keep track of things. So this has in addition the heartbeat. Heartbeat is basically a pinger and it will also collect the traces and forward our traces to Elasticsearch in the end. So this is the, the architecture. We have three very small servers running stuff and we'll throw requests against them and then we'll just monitor what is going on. So far, so simple. Um, this is the Elasticsearch and Kibana setup. Uh, pretty simple. So we have three availability zones. We have uh, three nodes there. Um, we also have a Kibana instance. We, we don't really use machine learning today, but there would be a dedicated machine learning instance as well. Um, that's running there. And well, not sure about that uh, memory pressure or how much memory we're using right now. We could see that dashboard live. But I guess you get the idea. We have multiple instances running. OK, so let's try to monitor something. Let's see where we can take this. So um, if you've never seen Kibana, um, this is Kibana. Let's see how uh, Okay, the screen more or less works. Is that readable for everybody, or is that too small in the back? It's probably too small. It's just like this resolution is not great, so it's not scaling perfectly, but let's say. So these are generally the things that you can do here um, in Kibana. Uh, we will focus on this cover. This is basically seeing the raw data. Visualize is building one visualization. There are a couple of pre-built ones that I've already loaded. And dashboards putting all of the visualizations together in one dashboard to see what is going on. I just fold that in here or collapse that again to save some screen space since, well, Screen space is precious here. Um, so uh, what I uh, want to see first is I want to see an overview of what I have running in my systems here. Is it still readable in the last row? Or is it too small? Is it OK? Yeah? OK, cool. Uh, because it feels pretty small, but yeah. With that resolution, it doesn't scale very well. Um, so as we've seen before, we have three nodes running. You can see overall the CPU user, uh, utilization is like 6%. Memory usage is like 57% or so. We see disk, uh, network traffic. Uh, we see a breakdown per uh, host, uh, how much is the memory and CPU usage. And we also have a heat map of the CPU usage. And you can see this instance here is pretty much idle. This instance here, okay, they need or uh, use up to 10% or so of their memory, but not much. Now we could, for example, dive into this one here. When I click on that instance, you can say here we're basically filtering down on that host name. Um, and you can see here, these are the details for that host. Um, and yeah, you just see here, for example, CPU usage, uh, memory usage. Uh, it just doesn't scale very well because, well, this is very tiny. Uh, let's see the general overview, which I can just do here if I add a star. Then you see uh, the metrics aggregated across all your instances, which looks something like this. This is unfortunately now slightly harder to see. Um, Let's make this one bigger so you can actually see it better. Here we can see these funny little spikes. You can see this is the used memory. And every few minutes, we have this spike. And basically, the first thing I want to figure out is why do we have these spikes? Like, wh what is our system doing here? And for this, we'll build our own uh, custom visualization. So um, you can see these are all pre-built visualizations. Also, the dashboards in the previous view, those were all pre-built. So I didn't build anything. I just used the pre-built dashboard since I'm lazy and 
you can be lazy too. You can just reuse what we have. Uh, so now we need to do something ourselves. These are all the visualizations that you can build in Kibana right now. Um, I want to use Visual Builder. So Visual Builder is pretty much for, if you have time series data, it's a very powerful tool to graph out what data you have. Here you can see these are, um, so we're always in the last 15 minutes. These are all the documents. So this is the count of documents that we have collected. So you can see every 10 seconds, we're collecting about 250 documents or so. But we're generally not interested in the number of documents that we're collecting. We want to see a specific metric that we are have. So um, let's say we want the system memory. And I want to see uh, what is the sum of the system memory that we are using. And we have a field that's called system memory, something like that. You see we have integrations in Kubernetes and Docker as well, but I'm just use, I just want to use the used bytes. I just want to see how much memory do my instances need. And then you can see, okay, this is some big ugly number. The first thing I want to do is, in options I can actually say, this is not a number, but these are bytes. Once you switch that over to bytes, it will show you okay here. Generally, we need 1.7 gigs of memory across all our instances, but every now and then we have this spike up to two gigabytes. So first off, I want to figure out on which insta instance do I have this spike. Um, let's see, so we can group everything here, and right now we have everything grouped together. What I want to do is I want to break that down on basically the host name, which I have in a field called b.name. We also have beat host name, I think, but beat name is the nice human readable one. And then we could say here, for example, we want to uh, uh, order that by how much memory you're using. And then you can see generally uh, most of my systems, like this one here, is very flat. This one here is generally flat but has these spikes. So the front end instance is the one that has these memory spikes. So generally it needs. 600 megs of, of memory uh, here, every now and then it jumps up until to 900. And we want to s know why, like what process is doing that. So what I'm doing here is I have one visualization for system memory, bless you, uh, and we can uh, actually see then, let's build something where we see the process memory. And for the process memory, let's switch color because green on green is not very good. Uh, let's say this one is red. Uh, Again, I want the sum of a specific field, and then there is one field which has uh, system uh, process memory RSS bytes. So these are the bytes used on a per process level. And once again, we need to break that down into the process name. Process.name, which is actually system process name. And I say I want to see the top 20 uh, processes causing that, and I want to order those by the sum of the system memory that we have. And then you can see, oh, there is this one spike that really strongly correlates here. And well, maybe unsurprisingly, it's Java that is causing that spike here. Uh, by the way, this is, this is really hard to see like what is going on here. I will add one more step. The nice thing here is this is pipelined. And the good thing about the pipelines is I can just add another step here. So I will add a math step where I basically just do a calculation. So I take this field that I've calculated here and just let's call it uh, memory. And then I can access it with params.memory. So basically params.memory references this field here and this is the field uh, that I've defined up here. So this is how this is tied together. And then I say uh, parents.memory uh, times minus one, and it should be minus. And then I can actually put that on the negative y-axis. And then you can see, okay, here on the front end instance, this is the memory I'm using. And for the processes, well, Java is taking up most memory and that also has the spike. Why, uh, oh, by the way, uh, this should probably be bytes as well. So we can actually see that. Uh, if you hover over that here, you can see, okay, Java generally is taking 450 megs of memory, but every now and then it jumps up to 700. Um, and I'm not doing anything smart back here. It's basically a cron job that is running something that I call the bad jar. And the bad jar just allocates memory until it crashes with an out of memory exception. But well, for the demo purposes, uh, here you can see, okay, which instance, which process, and then you can dive further, like, why is this doing, or why is my application behaving like this? But let's switch over to application now. So um, we can go to this URL, and now I need the requests from you. So ideally, everybody can hit that 
like I assume everybody has a laptop or a phone, uh, please give me some requests. Um, and we'll just keep monitoring these requests. So everybody who's going there, uh, I will see what you're up to, basically. Uh, something that comes in, by the way, since we're using that weird domain, um, did anybody figure out why we're using this domain? Any ideas? Let me switch to my title slide. It has something to do with my name. So it, it is my Twitter handle as well, uh, but it has something to do with my name. Um, any guesses what that could be? Everybody had too much cake. Too little coffee. Um, so it is, if you take my last name uh, and rotate the letters by 13, uh, that is what you get. The nice thing about rotating by 13, if you do it again, you're back at the original. It was the good old Rot 13, a long, long time ago. Used to like, um, sorry? Yeah, and, uh, Caesar I think is three because ABC. So that, that would uh, mutate it by three letters, yes, but it's the same approach. Rot 13 is just nice because encryption and decryption is the same. And it's, it was very common if you had like the spoiler for a movie. Uh, and you didn't want anybody to read it accidentally, you could ROT13 encrypt it and then nobody would read it accidentally. Um, and this is where the, this is coming from. And well, for a demo, I guess WTF is kind of the right thing to use, uh, so that's why we end up here. Um, so you can do some requests. Uh, if you go to a 200 with a parameter, it has a name in there and you can add en or enter whatever your name is and then it will also say hello, whatever name you have entered. And we will come back to these names. So if you enter your name here or anything else, uh, we'll probably find you in the logs afterwards. Um, let's see how creative you are. Uh, sometimes people are very creative, sometimes not so much. Uh, okay, so the next thing I want to monitor basically now is the network layer. Um, who's using Wireshark? Wireshark, anybody Wireshark? Normally uh, you see, wait, sorry? Sorry? Really, yeah, yes. Um, normally, um, when you see somebody having Wireshark open to debug something, you know it's a very bad day. Um, because you, you don't really want to do that. Um, sometimes, however, it is unfortunately necessary. Um, we have another beat to, to do that. So the first beat we saw was the so-called metric beat, because it was collecting metrics. We have another beat called packet beat, which can, which can collect uh, network data. It's using the same base library uh, like Wireshark lib pcap. Um, and it's just listening in on the background uh, to figure out what you're doing. So basically it knows this is a request, this is a response. Um, the protocol was HTTP, you got back a 200, the whole thing took 50 milliseconds, and the response code yeah, was a 200, and I don't know, some other parameters that you were sending in your request. So uh, with packet beat, uh, we have, let's start on the overview page. Well, we have a nice overview page, um, which uh, will generally show you, let's skip the client locations for now, you can see these were your requests, we can see these were your web transactions, so here you had like up to 200 or so requests. Um, we don't have a database cache or RPC system running here right now, uh, we're just doing web transactions. You can also see these are the number of requests, before you started your request this line was pretty flat. Now it got a bit more colorful and the height of the bar tells you how many requests and the color uh, how long one took. Like these are the quick requests up to 10 milliseconds, etc. You can see uh, per, uh, latency percentiles. So yeah, the slowest 99th percentile was already up to two seconds. So 1% of our users had to wait quite a bit uh, until they got their response. You can also see okay and error. And unfortunately, these colors are assigned randomly. So let's make okay green and error red so we can keep them apart a bit better. And now it probably makes more sense and you can see, okay, we had quite some errors here, like uh, up to 60% of our requests were errors, uh, but overall the, o the, error, uh, the requests are okay. You can also see uh, what was causing the errors, like we had mostly HTTP errors, we had one DNS error here and one TLS error somewhere which I don't even see. You can also see the latency histogram here, uh, like 2,000 of our requests are very fast, but somebody was unlucky and had to wait 3.4 seconds for their requests. Um, well, maybe we should figure out what was happening there. And then we can dive into the specific protocols. So first, uh, we have flows. Flows are pretty much uh, TCP IP information. It just knows um, who connected to who, um, how many unique uh, 
uh, connections did you have? Uh, which IP addresses are communicating with who and how much traffic are they causing? This is also helpful if your protocol is encrypted and we cannot see into your traffic because if your traffic is encrypted, well, we're kind of out of luck. And finally, we have the web transactions where you can actually see uh, what was going on on HTTP traffic wise. So uh, we had a bunch of requests here. Um, those were all your requests. Um, you can see overall we had 1,500 requests, uh, mostly to HMZ, um, which is always interesting uh, if I don't know the meaning of something, um, and I'm not sure if that is something I should know or shouldn't know, uh, but well, I don't have this page, so uh, it has gives you a 404 back. Uh, you can also see uh, which response codes you had and which were your most uh, called URLs. Um, so HMZ is the most common one, slow, slow call, etc. Um, how did we actually figure that out? Because probably it's hard to see in your browser, but here you can see uh, the traffic here is properly encrypted. Like this is HTTPS um, the way it should be. How could we see what's happening in your traffic? Any guesses? In the beginning, we had Nginx as the reverse proxy. So basically, Nginx is terminating TLS for me, and I'm looking at the traffic behind Nginx and my Java application. So I'm handing that over. So uh, Nginx is taking uh, TLS on port 443, and then we're ha handing over to the Java application uh, the traffic on port 8080, and I'm basically listening in on port 8080. If you have something encrypted, we cannot look into your traffic, but this is pretty much a feature. Um, that also means the more the more protocols that are encrypted, the less we can see. So PacketBeat supports uh, various databases like Mongo, Postgres, uh, MySQL, uh, but if your connection is encrypted, we cannot really see that. If you have the reverse proxy, yes, we can look into that. But assume we wouldn't be able to look behind the reverse proxy. Um, a lot of the information that we have there is also somewhere else. So let's quickly uh, SSH to one of my instances. Um, since we're using Nginx, what can we see in the Nginx logs? So we can see in, it looks something like this. Yes, so yeah, the, the requests and everything, that's what we can see in the in Nginx access logs as well. Um, so here, let's jump to the end and let's see. Um, here I have a health finger, but maybe if we scroll up a bit, we have something more interesting. So here, this is an example of what you ha can have in the Nginx access log or any access log. So you basically see an IP address, you see a date, a timestamp, a time zone, an HTTP verb, the good, the URL we hit, uh, sorry, the get, the HTTP verb, was the HTTP verb slash good for the, the endpoint we hit, the protocol, the response code, which was a 200, how many bytes were sent back, 283, um, and we can see a user agent that hit our endpoint. The old way to do that actually would have been to write a custom parser and just parse that information. However, we figured out everybody's kind of doing the same thing and parsing Nginx logs and Apache logs, and it's kind of boring to always parse the same logs. Um, so we have something called modules now for the thing to collect log files is called file beat, which is kind of obvious. Log files, file beat. Um, and that one supports uh, so-called modules. So we have an Nginx module, and it knows on your operating system, which is Ubuntu, the access log is in var log Nginx access log. And this is the general pattern of how that looks like. And we'll then parse that apart and know what is happening in your logs. And we also have a pre-built dashboard for that to show you um, what is going on. So heading over to the Nginx access log, um, Let's start with the overview. You can see here, uh, we have also drawn out um, where everybody is coming from. Where do, wh what is that information? How can I draw that out? <coughs> yes, it's a GeoIP lookup, basically. Um, there are the GeoIP databases, so you have an Sometimes you have good information, sometimes you have bad information, um, but it will try to map the IP address to a geographic region, and let's see how good it is today. So if we start zooming into that, well, at least it seems to be getting the region pretty right. Yeah, okay, more or less. I, I'm not sure exactly why it assumes that we are over here. Um, 
And I'm also not sure if this is the hotel Wi-Fi or this is mobile data, but one of them seems to be better. Like this one here is at least better. Uh, I'm not sure why this one is off. Um, by the way, if, you, if I use my phone and you use the roaming in another country, it will always have an IP address from Austria, so whenever I use my mobile phone, that my, tra my own traffic always looks like it's coming from Vienna. Um, why do we have so many pings from this other region here? Any guesses why we have uh, so many ping, uh, why we have so many requests here? Yes, this is the data center where my stuff is running, and I basically ha have a health check that is pinging my service continuously. So all these requests are basically my own pinger running in the AWS data center. Here you can see again um, how many requests have we done, uh, like what were the response codes. Uh, you can also see uh, which were the most requested URLs, and you can see how much traffic were we serving, like up to 2.9 uh, megabyte, and you can also see the user agents down here. And we could, for example, filter down on the user agents. So, for example, we could say, I'm only interested in the and with that size here, let's make that larger enough. Um, let's say I'm, I'm only interested in iOS. Um, no. I want to filter down on iOS. So, you can see we have filtered down on iOS, and then we see um, Okay, some of you are on iOS 11, but the majority has already upgraded to iOS 12. Um, like everybody else, probably. And yeah, so you, you can see um, what people are up to. And you don't need to use any fancy trackers or anything in your applications. It's just in the user agent and in your le regular logs, and you can just pull out the information from there. So that's all fine. We could also see um, the, the errors that we have. So if we have any errors in, in Nginx, uh, you can see here these are the log events in total. Um, and then you see, luckily, we didn't have any uh, Nginx errors, and you just see the, the raw requests here. So that's nice. Um, but not everything is good in my application. So for example, if I had hit that one here, I get an error. So it tries to load, uh, but then nothing happens. and. If my service is responding, did anybody start a denial of service on my my service? Which which happens, it's fine. Um, I can still keep monitoring. Uh, it will just be the the web service itself will be very slow. Um, I'm curious now. Because there are two options: either my internet is slow, but it looks okay, or somebody started something. No. Okay, my my service just my service just doesn't feel like reacting anymore. That's weird. Okay, for whatever reason, we'll we'll just keep monitoring and see um, how that behaves. Um, so the first thing I'm interested in is like how is my application generally behaving. So let me switch that over. I don't want uh, I don't want the metrics. I want to see the raw uh, log files. Let's quickly take a look at the log files as well. If my SSH session is still there. Let's see. Uh, var log apps front end. No, is my net is my network going down? Yeah, that is indeed true. But it feels like my SSH and everything is dead. Did I switch to the wrong Wi-Fi? No. Well, let's see if my phone is any better. Or it fixed itself now. So let's see. Um, let's. No, this is even worse. Uh, 10 kilobytes would should even work, but probably my SSH connection just timed out. Uh, da, 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 let's see. Okay, network is back. Let's var log uh, apps front end log. Okay. Let's see, this was a big bad stack trace, uh, the joy of Java here, but 
here you can see some more information. So for example, here we have an info message where we can see something. Uh, basically, you have the timestamp, the date, the log level, uh, probably the process ID, uh, the class where something happened, and then the log message in there. Looks like pretty standardized log message, right? Who is logging like this? Everybody, more or less? OK, you can totally do that. Um, I just don't like it because I'm lazy and I try to find shortcuts around it. So what I'm doing basically is um, I'm logging or I'm writing out my logs uh, in a structured format directly uh, in JSON. The nice thing is if you log to JSON and Elasticsearch stores JSON as well, you don't need to do any parsing. Basically, I'm just collecting that file. Let's scroll up through that long stack trace, but we'll have some more relevant information yeah, so somewhere here. Probably this was the same message. Uh, basically, here you have one event, uh, so you can see it's one JSON document, uh, which contains all the relevant information. So you can see the log level, the service, the process ID, the thread, the message, etc. Uh, if you have that, you don't need to do any parsing because it's kind of unnecessary. Your application has the information in kind of a structured format. Then you ri write it out in a log line, potentially as a big stack trace, and then you need to parse it back to actually work with that data. Um, if you write it out in a structured format directly, um, it's much easier. Uh, so since I'm using Java, I'm just using a new log appender, where I say I don't want to write out a log, but a JSON file. So I'm using logback in Java, and there is a logback appender for for writing out JSON. And that's basically all there is. So you don't need to do any changes in your application. It's just the, the log appender that you need to switch out. And then you have that. I'm writing out both just to have both options, but I'm just collecting the JSON. So to show you what we have here, um, this one here in the last 15 minutes, you see we had more than 4,000 events. However, that is not all from our application. This also includes the Nginx events and system level events. Um, so we need to filter that down. So let's say I want to filter that down. I have a custom field, which is called application is Java. And this will basically filter down to my Java application. Um, and then you can see we have 1,100 uh, events in my log here. And then we can expand that. By the way, I kind of didn't show any configurations so far. Just to give you an idea of what how I have configured this entire thing. Uh, file beat, file beat, YAML. Obviously, everything is YAML today. Uh, so how did I collect that file? Basically, what I've done is I've said everything in var log apps that is a JSON, please collect that. Um, I have given that, since I know this is only uh, Java applications, I add this custom tag application Java. This is exactly what we've used here to filter down on these events, because we've added this custom key. And I just said, OK, this is a JSON message. Um, to get the, the Nginx events, um, we need to scroll down a little further. If it will scroll down, no? I think my, my internet went away again. OK, let's switch back to the Wi-Fi and see if the Wi-Fi is better now. Yes. Let's try again. Because SSH is unfortunately a bit uh, unhappy if you switch networks. Uh, I hope nobody is downloading any Docker images in the background. And it's taking away all my Wi-Fi. Oh, this is not an improvement. Oh, let's see, maybe my mobile phone is still better. Well, let, let's see if that comes up again. But I can show you the configuration file here anyway. So. Um, this is basically uh, the configuration file I've created to co collect my uh, application log file. These are, by the way, the modules uh, we have used to collect the Nginx information. So all I did was basically, I said, file beat modules, uh, collect Nginx. I also have some auditing uh, information, some information about the operating system and some system information. I've tagged that with the host name and an environment and say this is a light sale instance. We're automatically enriching that with cloud and host information. I'll show you those in a moment. Um, and then we're basically uh, writing that out to Elasticsearch as well. This is just an Ansible template, so you don't need to see all my passwords here. So let's see if that keeps working here. So I mentioned we have two met 
kinds of meta information I've added. The first one is this host section here. So basically, uh, automatically with every log event, we collect like what was the host ID, IP address, on what operating system are you running. So for example, if you had issues with a specific operating system, you could just filter down to that only that operating system. And then we have also this cloud metadata. And here you can see where is all of this running. So you can see uh, the region, the availability zone, which uh, instance type you're using and the instance ID. So you can filter down to specific instances and then see what is going on there. And overall you can see, okay, this came from my front-end application, uh, this was the log message, and this was just all going more or less well. But, but we can add another filter which is, uh, for example, let's say we are only interested in the error messages, uh, which is in severity. Ah, no, I, I think for now it's fine, thank you, but um, I, I, will, I will shout if we need anything. Perfect, thank you. Um, okay, now I filtered down to the error messages, and you can see in the last 15 minutes we just had 20 me uh, 21 error messages. And here, if you unfold these, you can see, okay, here you have your, down here you have your stack trace. By the way, one other very nice feature, and this is a feature of the log appender, is I'm hashing every stack trace. So basically what I'm doing is um, I am throwing out everything that changes between requests and hash the rest of the stack trace. So I know what is one specific stack trace and then I can figure out how many times is that specific tr uh, stack trace appearing uh, overall. And we can actually graph it out. Um, so in my log appender, I have a setting. So when I, when I run into a stack trace, it will basically throw out the things that change. So if you use some reflection, it might change between requests. But it will, I have actually a rule to show uh, or to make sure that does not happen with. To make this more specific, let me, this is my Java application, uh, let's say we have source main in resources, we have that. So here, this is basically the rule, these are things that can change between requests. So if you have something uh, like Spring framework validation uh, or anything reflection based, that might change between requests, so I'm kicking that out. Um, but what I have configured down here, this is my JSON configuration, where I basically say, okay, these are all, uh, these are the, the events that I want to collect from a log event. And the other thing is I want to uh, collect that stack trace uh, or actually the hash of that stack trace. And that will then hash the stack trace. So for example, for this specific stack trace down here, for this specific stack trace here, this is the hash. And based on that, we can see how many times did that specific error happen. And to visualize that, uh, let's say, are you okay, okay with the vertical bar? Let's use a vertical bar chart. Um, so this is based on file beat. And in file beat, I want to say, uh, for the x-axis, I want to have a term. And the term I'm interested in is the stack hash. Uh, so we have JSON dot stack hash. Let's say I want to have the top 15 errors that I have in my messages, and if I calculate that, it will, if it's small enough, it will show you. Um, this specific stack hash here has happened 15 times, this one four times, and this one only twice. And then you know probably this is the thing I want to fix first because this has affected most people. Um, the other thing, by the way, um, I'm curious uh, what uh, names you have used. Did anybody use anything? Oops. Okay, it's all Philips. Um, did anybody try emojis? Uh, is that? No, this is not what I want. Okay, my application. Ah, my application lives. Uh, you, you're fine. Uh, so let's say, um, okay, I don't have enough space to get to my emojis. Um, let's let's use this emo emoji. So for example, here, if you add that emoji as a name, and if my service reacts, then uh, you will see that here the emoji will actually show up. And it will also show up in Kibana. It's because in the recent, most recent version, we are now supporting emojis in Kibana as well, uh, which is a very important feature. However, if you look uh, into that in your log files, 
um, you will see uh, that the log files don't correctly uh, let's see Okay, that should be more than fast enough, whatever whatever my system is up to right now. Um, anyway, in a log file you couldn't see the emoji properly, uh, but in Kibana, uh, let's see if Kibana is reacting. Oh yeah. For whatever reason that my own web service is not regi registering it. Uh, but yeah, these are text emojis, uh, but we also uh, support proper emojis. Um, so um, they, they should show up here. Uh, if my page would finally load, then it would be registered. Um, anyway, um, doesn't matter. My own application doesn't need to run anyway. OK, um, did anybody try to SSH into my instance? I'm just curious. Cur curious. It won't work. I'm, I'm using certificates, uh, but lots of people try. Um, this is, by the way, something uh, we, we can collect as well. Um, so here, um, let's make this slightly larger again. Here, I'm just collecting uh, the SSH access logs. And let's not just focus on the last 15 minutes. You can see lots of people tried. Let's say in the last seven days, um, you can see uh, I had, uh, that is, three hour time slices. So in three hours I had up to 10,000 uh, SSH requests against my three instances. And this will happen to pretty much any of your instances out there on the internet that somebody tries to brute force them. Uh, we just collect the in var log auth log. Uh, we have those logs and you can just see uh, what they are doing. And you can see, okay, here this was me where I was um, successful. Um, I gave my French colleague access with a password and you can see here he has been logging in the last time. Uh, and down here you can see a which usernames were the people using who, who failed to log in, and also where are they coming from? So if you zoom out, you can see, um, okay, China was the most active, like from China we had 75,000 uh, login attempts. Um, normally it's something like either it's China or Russia, it always depends a bit, but you can see here, okay, Russia was kind of sleepy this time. Uh, in Europe, yeah, in Europe, Ukraine was most active, like 1,400 requests, and yeah. Russia didn't like my IPs this time because they're just randomly scanning and this is what you get. And you're, I'm pretty sure your servers will pretty much look the same. It's just like if you don't watch it, uh, you don't even recognize that. But you will have plenty of failed auth uh, attempts in your logs. Um, okay, so that was uh, the authentication. Next up are uh, something, if my application works, um, I'm really, really curious what, if it's my network or my application, but something is misbehaving here. Um, but we can actually figure it out. So first off, we're pinging the application. Let's see um, if my application is still registered as up or down from my pinger. So for that, we have another beat, which is called heartbeat. Well, that's not so surprising. It's basically pinging things and sees, are they still alive or are they dead? Um, the last seven days is maybe a bit too much, let's say like in the last 15 minutes, let's filter down to that. And we can see um, something is down, which is not good. Uh, so most of the time everything was up, but something has been down here and I'm curious what it is. Um, let's filter down on that. So basically you click on that red bar here and we'll say, okay, yeah, for whatever reason my front end application is not doing well today, um, which is a bit surprising, but okay, it is what it is. Um, you can see it was down here, and you can also see the response times, which were really long. So basically, this chart here shows you how is your uh, application responding. Like, how long does it take to establish or resolve the DNS names, the, the DNS name, to establish the TCP connection, the HTTP connection, and then the TLS handshake. So we basically have the uh, breakdown of where are you spending your time when you try to talk to your service. And down here, you can also see the heat map of the breakdown of how long does it take my for my service to respond. Um, and it's not good that it takes three seconds for my service to give you an answer. So something is very wrong with my service. Um, something that might be interesting is, um, do we have any um, internal information or metrics from my application? Um, so generally, 
Or let's, luckily I have my second application running, let's switch to that one. Uh, so here, if that is responding, so here you can see health up, basically this is just a, an endpoint we can ping, and uh, this is not the tab I want, go away. And then we also have metrics. If you're not familiar with the Spring Boot metrics, they look something like this. Basically, they tell you which metrics are available and then you can look into them. So for example, if I take this one here, uh, it will tell you, and it's not very nicely formatted, uh, but this one here just gives you some information of how your system is doing. It just exposes these internal metrics on an HTTP endpoint. And it would be nice if we could continuously collect that. And we can actually do that in two different ways. A, we have something to collect HTTP metrics on a continuous basis. Um, and since it's a Java application, we can also collect JMX information, which is kind of the, the golden standard for, uh, for uh, Java applications. Uh, let's say, since this window is dead, let's try one on the back end. I'm curious if somebody is doing a denial of service attack against my front end instance or why it's behaving so badly today. Um, we, we might look into that at the very end. So uh, just to give you an idea, sudo vi etc metric bit metric bit yaml. What are we doing here? First off, um, we are collecting uh, the system metrics. This was the very first thing I've shown you today. Um, then we're also collecting like nginx uh, metrics. So for example, we know how many requests nginx is serving. Uh, it's actually a good point that I can show that. I always forget. So for the dashboards, we also have an nginx metric, uh, metric beat overview. And here you can see uh, how many active connections you have, how many requests we're serving, like this looks very uneven and weird. Um, and how um, nginx is just uh, handing out and it's funny that we have so many waiting requests on Nginx today. Something is wrong with my application, but we will figure out what. Um, anyway, coming back to the to these endpoints. So we have both, uh, so we can collect the HTTP endpoints, uh, which looks something like this, for example, here. I'm basically saying, I want to collect some HTTP information on that URL every 10 seconds, fetch that information and just store it in Elasticsearch. Or um, since we have a lot of these HTTP metrics, um, let's say we want to look at the Jolokia ones as well. So this here, Jolokia is basically a nice wrapper around JMX to expose that uh, via an HTTP interface that we can then collect easily. Um, this is Jolokia. Basically, I'm saying I have JMX running there. Um, just collect these beans and get some metrics from them. And what I want to do now is I want to see how my applications are doing. And to do that, I want to build another visualization to just graph out how they are doing. Let's say we have oh, another region map. I don't want the region map. I want a time series visual builder. Time series visual builder. That's the one I want. This time, we, we don't want to show the number of events, but I want to show like how much of the heap are we using. So I want to show the percentage of the heap usage that my Java applications have. Um, to do that, the first thing we need is uh, we, we need uh, to show the heap usage. Uh, we say we want to have the average, which you spell average, uh, of the field. There is a field Jolokia, metrics memory, heap usage, used. That is the one I want. That looks good. You can see it looks pretty spiky. Um, once again, uh, let's say this is not a number, these are bytes. And then I don't want to have that aggregated over everything. I want to break that down on a per host level again. Uh, or do we? No, we, we only have b.name. b.name. That's what I want. And you can see for one reason or another, uh, my front end instance is so overloaded that it doesn't even manage to send you any metrics anymore. And it's just a back end instance sending stuff on a regular interval. However, if we switch back like, let's say, one hour, you can see back here, both we're doing fine. Now, for s one reason or another, my application is is not doing so well. Maybe we're run running out of memory or something. We, we will figure that out. Um, anyway, so what we can do now here is as well, we can say, I want to add a second step or a second metric. Basically, I need to figure out how much heap do I have to calculate the the percentage of what I use. So I will call this the maximum and we have a field Jolokia. 
heap usage uh, used is not what I want, max. That is the field I want. And then the next thing I do is basically a calculation again where I have this math step. And then I need to put in these variables again. So let's say this one is used. And this one here, let's say this is max, where I say this is the maximum that I have. And then basically we say params.use divided by params.max. And this will give you how much or how many percent of your heap you're using. And you can see here, well, bytes doesn't make much sense. This needs to be percent. And then you can see back here, the front end instance was pretty flat and was using 10% of the heap and is still like 10, 20% here. Uh, my uh, back end instance is using like 10 or 8 to 10% of my heap and it has kind of like a more even pattern. Um, so that that's interesting. I'm still not sure why my front end instance is doing so badly. I'm curious if we are maybe running out of memory. Or if it's just... The problem is if you don't have enough resources to show anything, uh, it's hard to figure out what is going on. Ah, yeah, okay. It looks like uh, we just ran out of memory here and... Whatever happened here, but very bad stuff is happening. And we, we would need to get back to actually figure out which process was causing or taking up all that memory. Uh, maybe it's again a Java application or something like that that's just killing our instance. But yeah, this one is not happy. Uh, we'll probably need to restart it to fix that. Or actually figure out what the problem is. Okay, final thing which we haven't covered yet is um, traces. Um, and I made one slight mistake. I made an upgrade to my instance and I lost the right dashboard for that. Uh, we'll have to use the generic ones now. So we have, for tracing, we have something called APM, Application Performance Monitoring, uh, which basically looks into your services to figure out like which services do you have running and how are they behaving. So you can see um, what are the response times and you can see here also like, oh, our front end service was not doing well because the response times spiked to 20 seconds or so. Um, this is not anything a service should do. Um, and you can also see uh, how many requests we were serving. And once again, the backend seems to be fine, but the front-end front -end instance is just behaving in a not so great fashion. Uh, you can see, okay, these are my services. What are the percentiles? Like mostly they're doing fine, but overall something is wrong here. And that looks just into your Java code to, to trace that down. And you can also see, for example, the errors that are happening or the transactions. So here you can see these are all the errors that were happening. These were the errors when you clicked on them. And you can just see the breakdown. Basically, this is the one exception that was, we got 146 of these errors. And then you need to figure out, okay, who was causing them? What was the problem about those? Um, and in the transactions, you can basically see, okay, Response percentiles, um, which have kind of increased a lot. Uh, the transactions per minute, which were surprisingly high here, and how many requests we were uh, serving and which controller basically uh, was causing all of that. The nice thing about this is, this is not a build dependency, but this is just a runtime dependency. So basically to add the tracing and to see the, the transactions, uh, we just add the tracer at runtime. So there's a Java agent, you basically add the dash Java agent to your application at runtime and uh, figure out where that should send your, uh, send your requests. So just to give you an idea how that might look like for, for example, the front-end instance, this is how I configure my entire service. For example, here, I'm just saying, okay, I'm loading my Java agent in whatever version I have installed right now. And then um, I am sending that to this APM server, which will aggregate it, uh, it will know, okay, I want to sample all my requests. You could just say I want to sample like 10% of my requests uh, and collect them. This is a production environment and it will know all of that and then you can filter down on those again. So, dum -dum 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 -dum, we have good made good progress. I always compare this thing a bit to Lego. So you have all the building blocks and you can combine them in whichever way you want. 
but it's not like a final solution. Like you need to configure them in the right way. So I, in the repository, you have some uh, of this, some of the configurations to actually do that. Uh, and the nice thing is you can totally customize that. So you can include, for example, the transactions from the business side to know how many people are on my website, how much are we selling, uh, how many people are signing up for my newsletter. Since it's all customizable, you can include that in your metrics. And then you might see like, oh, I have more errors or I have a higher response time on my website and suddenly people are buying less. Um, and you would, would be able to see all of that. It's just the way of combining the Lego blocks in the right way. Um, we have looked at quite a lot of different things. Um, I don't think I need to go through everything that we've done in the past hour or so. Um, if you want to play around with that, um, I have a dashboard only mode where if you go to dashboard.terawtf, you can just see the pre-built dashboards. You cannot delete any data. Um, you cannot create new dashboards or create custom visualizations, but you can see the existing dashboards. Um, and then here on the, on the other address, you basically get the source code and see how everything was put together. Okay, questions. Um, by the way, I have a couple of stickers here. If you want stickers, just grab them afterwards. Um, in the meantime, since we're competing with open spaces, questions? Yes. Wait, we have, I think we have a microphone. Uh, since Elasticsearch can be used to store log data, uh, can you configure the, uh, the bits or the Elasticsearch to uh, make the data expire, say, for after six months? automatically delete it? Yes. Um, the answer is yes and no. So um, what we have today is um, we have a project right now to do that for you. Uh, let me show you Elastic Curator. Curator with a C and I normally head over to the GitHub repository. This is a thing basically. It is basically a glorious cron job. And it will, you can just uh, define schedules and you can say after six months I want to take a snapshot and then I want to delete the data or um, I want to move that to a different node or whatever. Um, very soon we will also have a similar functionality in Elasticsearch itself. Yeah, so um, this is an external application. Uh, it is maintained by us, it, but it is a standalone Python application today. Um, we have something called Index Lifecycle Management um, that will be able to do that uh, for you very soon. Um, give me one moment and I can show you a screenshot. Um, because this is, it, no guarantees, but we will, it will take a few more months, but then it will be integrated in the rest of the stack. Um, we need Elastic Vienna. This is where I talked about it. Um, and then we have something like Lifecycle. Okay, this might be a bit hard to read, uh, but you can see basically you can create a life cycle for an index and then you can say, for example, today this is on a very fast note because to today's index we are writing data and for the rest of the week we'll mu move that to a warm node uh, which has slower disks uh, or higher density uh, on the node. Um, since you're not writing anything anymore, but you might do a lot of searches. Mm. And then after one week, you move it to a slower node. And that slow node just stores as much data as possible. And there you just keep your data for the ni next five months or whatever. And there you normally don't search that often. And there it's okay if your search takes a little longer. Okay. It's just much cheaper. And then after five or six months, we're actually deleting the data. Mm. And yeah, you can see this will be built, like the UI will be built into Kibana. So you can just manage the entire life cycle through Kibana. Mm. Um, and the times are configurable. Yes, and the times are totally configurable. Um, and you just have, like, we will have a few templates uh, with these common things that you have, like, mm. different node types. And depending on what data you have, like, more current data is on faster nodes and all the data is on slower, slower nodes. Nodes. And you can also delete it. Uh, like, all of that can be configured. And it's this then running as part of the cluster. Um, the other thing that will also, or the Elasticsearch side is already out. Um, it's just a Kibana UI that will make this uh, easier. Is not out yet. Is um, we have something called rollups, and I probably have a screenshot here as well. 
this is a bit hard to see, but this makes it much easier to store your metrics long term. Because rollups basically you say, um, for this specific metric, and you need to do that for every single metric, um, I want to have specific um, aggregations, and I don't, but I don't want to store the original data anymore, but rolled up or aggregated data. Because today, for example, you care about 10 second intervals, but in tomorrow or in, th in three days, you might only care about one minute intervals or one hour intervals. But you want to be able to see that longer term. What that basically does is, yes, it takes your data, it aggregates that, that over the specific time slice that you have. Um, it is available for on the Elasticsearch API, so you can already do that. That UI to actually define that in a nice fashion um, is coming pretty soon as well. I think that has already been merged into master now. It's not released yet, uh, but it's out. Um, so this is generally, um, this will make it much easier to manage that data. The only downside is that Uh, the, the API might look slightly scary. Let's add to the stable version. Let's say we want to create the job. Uh, do we have an example? Yeah. Because here you basically say, okay, on this index pattern, like all my sensor data, I want to roll that up into sensor data. Uh, roll up, I want to run that every half hour, like this is cron job, like syntax. Um, and I basically want to roll that up into uh, one hour time slices with it after seven days. Um, and then you want to have the field temperature and voltage. And for temperature, you want to uh, calculate minage, uh, minimum, maximum, and sum. And for voltage, just the average. But you need to, we need to define that for every single field uh, in your data. Which, which calculations do you want to do on them? And then in the background, we'll calculate that for you, and it will just take a fraction of the space. So that will make it much easier to store your metrics long term, especially when you don't care about fine-grained data anymore. So that will make it much cheaper to work with that. Any other questions? Yes, sorry. Wait one moment, please. My question is about the ASA clustering and replicas. Uh, assume that we are writing a, a, a documents in some index and we have a replicas. Yeah. And we would like to search uh, our documents from replicas and from primary chat, but sometimes the search result may not be equal to each other. And we use the refresh interval time in order to avoid this problem. Yes. But do, do we need have a, a better approach in order to solve this problem? Because re w refresh interval What are you said? Oh, you're doing an explicit refresh. Yeah. OK. Um, how much time do we have? Uh, for logs? Uh, give me, OK, give me three minutes, and we'll try to uh, quickly draw that out. Um, because I it's a very interesting question. I'm, I'm sorry for the other side. I'm <laughs> let's see. I'm if I, I'm not sure that will work out very no this is not going to work out for everybody but yeah if you want to see something uh, move, move back or move somewhere else I, I will I will try to uh, quickly uh, draw that out uh, that because that's generally an, an interesting question so let, let's say we we have an index operation so we basically want to store a document and uh, we have our cluster here. Um, and we have, let's say, let's keep it simple, let's say we have three nodes in our cluster. Okay. Uh, um, let's say we have one node here, uh, one node here, and another node here. Um, so, your index operation is coming in, and it's randomly hitting this node here. And this node here is now the so-called coordinating node for your um, request. So this is the uh, coord. This is the coordinating node, and that coordinating node will then figure out um, for this document that you try to index, what is the primary shard, and if you have replica shards configured, which ones are the replica shards. For example, this one, might the coordinating node might then figure out that this node here. Is the primary uh, has the primary shard of your data, 
So what it will then do is, so let's say this is the uh, primary and this is the, uh, the replica. And we have configured um, the index into which we are writing this uh, has one replica. So we have one primary shard and one replica shard. Then the coordinating node will basically forward that request, so this is one, will forward that request to that shard here, this is the operation two. Um, then the primary shard will check, can I do that right operation? Aye. If yes, it will also figure out, okay, this is my replica. It will then say, okay, here, I'm starting to write this document, but I'm also writing it to here. And this is three. And then at some point, uh, the replica um, acknowledges that back. That would be step four. And the replica is acknowledging that to the primary shard. The primary shard then checks, okay, the replica has acknowledged, I have written the data. Um, it is then acknowledging that back uh, to the coordinating node. And then in the step six, uh, the coordinating node is acknowledging the right to the client that has issued the right. Yeah. So what happens actually when you try to write the data into one of the nodes? Um, so Apache Lucene is the thing that writes the data to disk. Um, and Lucene has this concept of a Lucene segment. Mm -hmm. And basically it creates a new Lucene segment every second by default. Um, so let's say, let's use blue again. So this here, this is the segment. Um, Basically, you create one new segment when you have writes. Every second, you will create one new segment in memory. And then after one segment, you actually write out that created segment to disk. And this is immutable. So um, no update will happen to that. Basically, if you update the document, it will be marked deleted um, and will be written into a new segment. There are never changes to that segment. Why are we creating that segment uh, only once a second? Because otherwise, we would have too many small segments. Um, and what happens if you uh, delete more documents and if you have more segments over time, we will merge segments uh, over time together. Um, if you fetch a document by ID, you will be able to retrieve that document immediately. If you search it, um, in the worst case, you will need to ha wait up to that one second to actually be able to get back the document because, well, the refresh hasn't happened, the segment hasn't been created, so you're not able to search it yet you can force the segment to be created immediately if you um, set the refresh on the request and basically say, I don't care, create me a new segment immediately when I write the document, which is generally a very bad idea because you will have tiny segments and you will spend a lot of time merging them together afterwards. Um, what is much better, if you need to wait for the segment to be or the document to be searchable, um, there is a newer command that was added in 5.0 or in some 5 version um, is, if I'm not mistaken, is called, um, it's a parameter, uh, the, the refresh. Uh, so you basically add a refresh um, and that is then called uh, wait, something called wait for refresh. This is not the right syntax, uh, or this but if you say search for Elasticsearch, refresh, wait for, um, it will show up. So basically, this is a command you can add. And what this will do is, this entire writing here will block until the segment has been created. So you need to able be able to handle uh, that that request might take one and a half seconds or so at worst case. But the, this acknowledgement back here will only be returned when I know that I have created the segment with that data and it's searchable. Mm -hmm. So you will not create unnecessarily small segments, um, but your application will only get the acknowledgement when that data is actually searchable. And this is generally what we recommend if it's possible. Depending on your use case uh, to have higher uh, indexing performance or write performance, even set the refresh rate to a higher value. If you set it to five seconds, for example, you will be able to write more. You can even, if you do some bulk loading of old data, we would recommend to set the refresh rate temporarily to minus one, and it will then create the segments just on demand. Basically, Lucene will figure out when it is necessary. Um, but then it can be written in a best performant way, basically. Um, yeah, um, it's something wait for refresh. 
let me let me look up the right command. I, I'm I'm am I'm a very bad uh, I I'm very bad at uh, memorizing these. Uh, wait for refresh. S search. Oh, it was actually correct. Okay, you have refresh and then wait for, um, and then basically it will block your call um, until it has been written. That is what we would recommend. You can force it with, with general, uh, so initially we only had um, refresh, or you could say that refresh equals one that will force the creation of the segment. But again, um, or refresh true. Uh, but this is not recommended because you will create lots of tiny segments and merging them will be very costly. It will be both costly in more IOPS because, well, you need to take the data and rewrite it, but it will also fill up your heap more because you need to merge that in heap and write it out. Um, so don't do refresh. Don't force the refresh. I know it can be annoying, especially for unit tests. That's where I, I sometimes do that, that I force the refreshing immediately so, I can, so I'm able to search for it. Uh, but yeah, don't really do it. That's one of the reasons why we're always very careful when people say like, is Elasticsearch a database? We're always careful to say like, yeah, we, we're a data store. And there are some trade-offs around that. For example, the way we write data, in the immutable way and with the creation of the segments, your data is not necessarily searchable immediately after writing, which is something you expect from a database. But we're not a database, so that's why kind of the behavior for that is different. Does that answer the question? Yeah, thank you. We will try to refresh wait for also. Yes. Now we are currently looking for a solution in order to solve the problem uh, that in search request, the difference between primary shards and replica shards. Uh, if the search request is hit the uh, replica shards and we, we sometimes get the different results because uh, some indexing is not written into replica shards yet. We continue to doing search requests. Are you on six already or still on five? We are latest. No. Sorry, latest? Latest. Yeah, so um, there, there will be some changes in the future. Um, right now, um, those write operations are basically uh, independent. So um, the refresh can happen at different times here and here. Uh, we have in six, we have added something called the transaction log or transaction ID. Um, then basically every operation that we do is counted here and we will know um, who has which write operations. Um, let me, this is a Q&A session, it's, it's very nice to, to, to show some stuff. So let me uh, get, I have one nice animation to show how that works. If I would just remember how my, no it's not a merge, it's not a number. Uh, sequence number, this looks good. This is, this is the way um, how this is being handled. So basically, you're writing the document zero to the primary shard. It's being replicated to my, I have two replicas in this example. And you have local and global checkpoints. And so they all know that they're in sync and who has data and who doesn't have the right data. Um, here you can see every time we write something, we acknowledge back the local uh, checkpoint so that the primary uh, shard knows that we have all those documents. Now the primary shard will die. Oh no, sorry, the next, that's then the next step. So here you can see basically um, the checkpoints move on because the primary shard saw that it had those. It's writing out those documents, now the primary shard is dying, and now they have an election. Or no, no, it's not an election, sorry. There's a decision like who is the new primary shard. And the new primary shard is the one in the middle. And that one basically tells the other replica then to roll back that document for because it has never seen the document for and will basically kill the document for, but make sure that both are in sync. So generally, uh, with, uh, with these new uh, transaction IDs, the data should be the same. The only thing that can be different is generally this refresh rate. If you do a an, an fetch by ID, you, should, or you will always get the current state, but you have this one second, or depending, like one second is only the default. If you set the refresh rate to a different value, it will be different. Um, 
but that's normally the only window where data should diverge. But we basically have, with this local and global checkpoint, we know who got which write operations. And then we make sure that everybody applies them in the right order and has all the right operations. Otherwise, we will roll back a document if it kind of didn't make it to the right nodes. So I'm surprised. If you're on six, uh, losing documents should be much harder than before. It doesn't mean that you have like a consistent view, like depending on where you query goes, it might have refreshed already or not. That is something we'll probably try to tackle in the future. There are a few ideas how to do that and still work around the segment creation. Uh, but generally, like the data long term, like after a few seconds, should normally be the same. It's hard to say in general without trying it out. Like, and, and you mean like for, for you it's like uh, consistently in a different state. Like you, you have just missed out documents on one replica. So one yeah. replica is giving you different results than another replica. Yeah, if search class hit the replicas, then we will get the different results. Because we have uh, uh, many search class coming to Elasticsearch. That's very unexpected. That should not happen. I'm I'm honestly curious if you could replicate that. Uh, if you do, uh, open a GitHub issue because that should not happen. Um, yeah, if it does, it's definitely a bug. Like that, that should not be able to happen. Okay. Thank cool. you. Any other questions? Should I draw anything else? Yes, please. Hi. Is Hi. it possible user base access limitation uh, for logs on Kibana? Um, <laughs> yes, it is. But this is how we pay my salary. Um, so anything, um, anything security based is commercial for us. So generally, we have the open source stack. And then we have some uh, features on top of that uh, which are commercial. And one of them is everything around security. Um, so yes, you can generally, um, like you can, we have pretty fine-grained permissions. So it can be either on the index level. It can also be on specific fields. Or you can define for specific documents a rule. So for example, if it's a security event, only the security team can actually see mm -hmm. the document. Um, but unfortunately, or Fortunately, unfortunately, whatever. Um, <laughs> that is uh, how we make money. And since we're qu kind of large, uh, we have a lot of salaries to pay. Uh, and that is one of the ways we do that. We have consulting and support, and we have various things. But the and the cloud service, but the commercial uh, plugins are one of the ways how we keep the company running, basically. Okay, thank you. Well, I guess we took way more time than we planned. Um, thanks a lot. If you have more questions, just come to me afterwards. Uh, I'll be around for a bit longer and grab some stickers. Thank you.